In today's world, everybody wants to be great. But what does it actually mean? Today we're learning three secrets that Jesus teaches us about greatness. And these are secrets because not everybody is actually willing to do these things. Jesus is gonna teach us the hard things that we all must do if we want to be great. You ready? I'm ready. Well, grab your bowl of Frosted Flakes because we're about no, to- Don't do that. Er that. Nobody even knows what you're talking about. <laughs> everyone knows what that means, Bo. Oh, Bo, does everyone know what that oh means? Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, everybody wants to be what? Great. We're about to run it down. That's what I was gonna say. Okay. <laughs>guys what's up you are listening to the rundown podcast my name is byron and i'm joined as always by my boy trevor knox trevor say hello ni hao hey on today's episode of the rundown we're going to be given the secrets to greatness according to jesus trevor do you want to be great i want to be great do you want to be average i don't want to be average how would you like to come in third place I do that too much. Don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, I think there's something inside of all of us that really desires for greatness. And we're going to be talking about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And what does Jesus have to say about greatness? Because I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus, he is the greatest. Did you know that? I do. Jesus is the greatest. No one has ever been like Jesus, and there will never be anyone like Jesus. Whether you're a Christian or not, Jesus has impacted your life in a pretty great ways. I mean, all of human history really hangs upon the life of Jesus. BC, before Christ, AD, and Domini, in the year of our Lord. He was voted by Time Magazine as the person of the millennia. He has shaped philosophy. He has shaped uh, the economy. He shaped religion. He's shaped the way that we treat each other, certain cultural values that we have, even words and phrases that we use. It's all really been defined or been impacted by the life of Jesus. Jesus has had the greatest impact on human history. And today, Jesus is going to show us the secrets to his greatness. But before we dive in to the secret of greatness, according to Jesus, um, we have a big favor that we want to ask you. Could you go ahead and subscribe to the Rundown Podcast? If you're watching on YouTube, you can go to youtube.com slash redemption church. And we have the podcast that is on a video form uh, every single week. So just click subscribe, ring the bell. You can get some notifications. We also do more than the rundown. Every week we post uh, sermons. We post sermon archives, clips, updates, bonus teachings from me, all sorts of great content to be able to help you experience life change through Jesus beyond the Saturday or the Sunday. You can do it on Saturday too. You can do it any day beyond the Sunday into every day. And if you're listening on audio format, whether on iTunes or Spotify or SoundCloud, go ahead and give us a subscribe and a five-star review. And when you do, Trevor does something amazing in the office. Trevor, what did you do last week? Last week? Well, I didn't do anything because Brandon preached. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what will you do this week? This week, I will finish the book I started in January. <laughs> That's actually, you're supposed to finish that in January. <laughs> Run it back. It's okay. So Trevor is going to do what he is supposed to do if you leave a five-star review. So today, we're going to be getting into the uh, three secrets of Jesus's greatness. Hey, Trevor, uh, earlier in the week, I asked you a question. I asked you, as Christians, are we supposed to want to be great? So what do you think about that question? Do you think Christians are supposed to aspire towards greatness? At first hand, I say no. Really? Why is that? Because we're supposed to be humble. Oh. And not seen and lowly, yeah. but servants. Humble, lowly servants, that's all. Yeah, Christians aren't really encouraged to aspire for greatness. I mean, um, I mean, we think, we, when you think of greatness, uh, in our culture, Christian isn't really the first thing that comes to mind. When you think greatness, um, you think about musicians or athletes or celebrities or bosses or wealthy people or people they write biographies about. You know, you think about those things and you're like, oh, that's what greatness is. That's what I aspire to be. And Christians, well, we're always kind of like subpar. Like, have you listened to Christian music? 
Yeah. Have you listened to Christian or watched Christian movies? Oh, Lord, help Have us. you seen Christian t-shirts? <laughs> you know, they're, they're not really synonymous with greatness. I mean, I, I think that's actually a shame uh, because I believe that Jesus wants us to be, to be great. Um, most of the amazing um, like cultural things that we experience today are actually by Christians who aspired for greatness. So um, universities were actually started by the, the by Christians. So uh, Princeton University, one of the most prestigious universities, uh, was a, originally a Presbyterian university, started for pastors and started by pastors. Um, Oxford University and a lot of the prestigious universities, actually the church created the college system uh, many, many years ago. So oh, that's, wow. that's greatness. Um, hospitals were started by churches, right? Hospitals are great. Do you think that? I do. I think hospitals are great too. Um, libraries were, were really pushed forward because of Christians who are preserving their spiritual heritage and their history. Uh, slavery was ended by Christians. So William Wilberforce in uh, Europe, he did a great thing. He ended slavery in Europe. I mean, are you glad slavery's Praise God. not a thing? Yeah. Yes. So we, we that, can thank, this is great. we can thank Christians for that. In America, it was Harriet Beecher Stowe who had a dream, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, really led a lot of that. And she was a Christian. Most of the things that we enjoy today were because Christians aspired towards greatness. And I think this is a really important message for the church to, to rediscover as Jesus's redefinition of what greatness really is. That we wouldn't just settle for average or that we wouldn't settle for third place, but that we we would aspire towards greatness. And the disciples, actually in the text that we've been studying in Mark, they're having a conversation about, about greatness. When you're hanging out with somebody who's better than you, okay, does that does that make you want to be great? Think yeah. about it in jujitsu, right? So uh, for those of you who don't know, Trevor is a uh, jujitsu instructor and you're like a semi-pro jujitsu grappler. I'm what, a competitor. What's the, what's the, yeah. yeah, a competitor. I'm a competitor. You're, I am a competitor. I'm Listen a competitor. to that. Uh, positive affirmation. Uh, so so when you hang out with your professor or when you hang out with your, uh, your instructors or those who are a degree or two degrees uh, greater than you in jujitsu, does that inspire you? Of course. You're supposed to surround yourself with people who, you know, are already great at the thing you want to be great at. Yeah. And it's easy to surround yourself with people who are worse than you. Yeah. It's yeah. a little too easy. And you're like, I am the greatest. I did that too. Yeah. And you, so you just hang out with losers. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's how, that's why I hang out with this guy. No. Um, so you hang out with people and uh, who are greater than you and it inspires you to, if you only hang out with people who are less than you, you're never really going to be aspire to be any better than what you already are. So the disciples, they've been with Jesus for three years. They've seen him preach, teach, heal. They've seen him perform miracles, do signs, wonders, walk on water. They've seen Jesus, you know, do all of these great things. And I was thinking about it as I was studying through the text is the reason that they want to be great is because they see Jesus doing great things and they want to be like Jesus. And so if we want to be like Jesus, we should want to be great. And Jesus is the greatest. And I believe in this text, Jesus isn't shaming them for desiring to be great. Some people, you've been shamed because you want to be great. And I don't think Jesus is doing that. I think what Jesus is doing here instead is he's revealing his secrets to the greatness that he has. And he's trying to show them the way to be great, to be like him and not to be like the world or what their own desires or their false definition of greatness truly is. Right. And so we're going to dive into the three secrets to Jesus's greatness. But I do want to just keep in mind that like Jesus wants you to be great. He wants you to be great at jujitsu. He wants you to be a great husband. He wants you uh, to, to be great as you serve and work up here at the church. Jesus wants me to be a great dad. I believe that Jesus wants us to be great, to be great at our jobs, to be a great witness, to be a great influence in the world, that the church should have great art, the church should have great music, the church should have a great testimony, the church should have a great witness. Like people should be looking to the church to see what greatness really looks like. They've done it for thousands of years and really only in the last hundred or so has have we lost the secrets to greatness. And so um, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna dive into the three secrets of Jesus's greatness. Trevor, what is the first Secret. The first secret to Jesus's greatness was to learn to suffer. Yeah, because he's with his he's with the disciples, and the disciples it's uh, John and James. John and James walk up to him and they say, "Hey, 
Jesus, we have one favor to ask you. And Jesus is instantly like, okay, what would you like? He's like, we want to sit at your throne to the mm-hmm. left and right of you. Yeah. For you who are the greatest, right? So yeah. they're aspiring. They, they want this greatness blatantly. Mm-hmm. They're asking about it. Right. So I think it's funny because that they go up to Jesus, uh, like you said, and they want to sit next to him in glory. Glory is where great people sit. Yeah. Uh, I, I just imagine the way that the story goes down, you know, and they go, <clears throat> um, hey, Jesus, we have a favor to ask you. But before we ask you, uh, we want you to say yes. <laughs> Yeah, they're like, I'm going to ask you something, but I want you to go ahead and agree to whatever it is that I'm going to ask you, and uh, and then and cool. then and then cool. I'll ask you. And they're, and they're like, just we want to sit at your right hand and left hand. We took a vote. You can sit in the middle because we do want to be humble, but we know that you know we want to sit on the right hand or the left hand. You know, James can get the right or I can get the right. It's you know, it's your choice. Beggars can't be choosers, but whatever you pick. But I want to sit at your right hand, and left hand. They wanted to have. They wanted to have have glory. See, for them. They, they didn't understand the secret to Jesus' greatness. They knew that he was the Messiah, the promised Holy One, the anointed one of God who was gonna come in and he was gonna reestablish this great kingdom, but they thought that the kingdom was gonna be the kingdom of the world. Right. They thought that the Messiah was a political military leader who's gonna overthrow Rome and the Jewish, uh, the Jewish system and then set up a monarch in Jerusalem where Jesus was gonna rule and reign a earthly world worldly kingdom from Jerusalem and he was going to sit on a throne. And so they're thinking like, Hey, we're the right hand. We're the disciples. Like, like this is going to go good for us. Like we're, we want to, we want to have power in this new kingdom. We want to have authority in this new kingdom. We want to have glory in this new kingdom so that everyone comes and sees us. And that was their definition of greatness is that everybody would come look at them. Everybody would come see them. Everybody would come bow down to them and they would get in the chair and people would come visit them. That was their definition of greatness. But Jesus here, he's not going to rebuke them in a moment. What he actually does is he redefines greatness. See, greatness isn't bad as long as it depends on what your definition of greatness is. Right. So Jesus redefined greatness for the disciples. Yes. Yes. See, their definition of greatness was that everybody would come glorify them. But Jesus' definition is that they would glorify him. See, their definition is that everyone would exist to serve them. Jesus' definition is that you exist to serve him. And if your definition of greatness looks no different than the world, then your definition of greatness is wrong. If your definition of greatness is more money, more power, more reputation, more prestige, if your definition of greatness is no pain, no heartache, no suffering, no trouble, no trauma, if if that's your definition of greatness, just comfort, convenient, and ease, and hey, everybody come look at me, Jesus says, we will never be great. That's not the right definition of greatness. The, The definition of greatness is that you exist to glorify him. So he doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't say, don't desire to be great. No, instead, he redefines it, and he says, I want you to learn how to be great like me. And with this new definition, he begins to teach him that greatness is actually found first in learning how to suffer. I think it's really fascinating that in this text, Jesus connects greatness or suffering with uh, baptism and communion. So we actually had baptisms this Sunday, which was incredible. 22 people got baptized, and it was so uh, beautiful. But baptism and communion, which are sacraments, are actually symbols of Jesus' own suffering. That Jesus, at, uh, at the cross, his broken body and shed blood for our sins, we remember that through communion, the cup and the, and the, and the, and the, the bread symbolize the broken body and the shed blood. And as long as you take this, you're proclaiming the Lord's death. That is suffering. Baptism is death, burial, resurrection. That is Jesus' suffering. And so he connects Um, one of the things that we view through the sacraments as the greatest act of love as actually an act of of suffering. And so he asks him, he says, will you be able to drink from the cup? You want to be great? Can you drink from my cup? They're like, yeah. He's like, okay, you're going to drink from this cup. This is the cup of suffering. And if you want to be great, you, you have to learn how to suffer. And James and John, they modeled that throughout their life. Uh, James was the first one to be martyred, and his death in Acts chapter 6, I believe, became the the birth of the missionary movement where they began sending churches out. John, he suffered by 
being the only disciple who did not die a martyr's death, but he was boiled alive in oil and he was exiled to a prison island called Patmos where he writes five books of the Bible. Those books would never have been written if John never learned how to suffer. Churches never would have been planted if James never learned how to suffer. Redemption Church would not be here. You would not be listening to the rundown today. Trevor would not be my right-hand man if it was not for James and John learning to suffer and not just suffer, but learning to suffer well. We would never be able to experience God's word. Yeah. If they didn't learn how to suffer. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That's why the Bible was written. Right, in the sermon I said, um, the path to greatness is paved with suffering. You know, I've discovered that a lot of people want to avoid suffering. Uh, they don't want to go through it, the pain, the inconvenience. They don't want to go through the, the poor pay. They don't want to go through the difficulties or the hardships. And because they don't know how to endure suffering, they'll, ever, they'll never actually be able to achieve greatness. If you read biographies or you watch life, you know, stories of men and women's lives, all the people who have done great things and all the people we admire or inspire to be like, they all went through difficult and trying seasons. Yeah. And so if you live your whole life trying to take the path of least resistance to avoid any form of suffering, you're actually going to be running away from the very thing that God wants to use to make you great. The path to greatness is paved with suffering. And, um, and I mean, we've, we've all experienced this somewhere in our life. And I don't know what suffering, you know, you're going through as you're listening. I don't know what suffering we're walking through. I know that I have suffered. I know that we all have suffered because the question isn't, will you suffer? That's, that's guaranteed. The question is, what will you do when you suffer? How will you respond to the suffering that you experience? Because we live in a broken and fallen world. I mean, it is inevitable. So what are we going to do when we suffer? Are we going to run from it? Are we going to run to it? Right. Because as a Christian, it's going to happen. Right. I thought you said it in the message. <clears throat> are we going to run away from our suffering? Or are we going to take our suffering to Jesus? Yeah. Right. That's where growth happens. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, there's there's a there's a woman in our church that I, I love dearly, um, who she just recently posted for prayer requests, mm-hmm. and uh, she found out that she has breast cancer, mm-hmm. and um, devastating, you know. And I'm thinking about her her and her life and it would be so easy for her to run away from god in this season you know and then um but instead after yesterday's message she she's running to god and i actually you know she could say god why me god why now god why am i going through all of these things but that's not the question she's asking she's not asking god why she's asking god what god what are you going to do through this god what are you doing in my life god what are you going to teach me what are you going to show me how am Am I going to um, be great mm-hmm. through this? Mm-hmm. And so instead of running away from the suffering, she's taking it and she's running to Jesus. And I actually saw her up front worshiping on Sunday. And my heart was just filled with so much joy and gratitude because, you know, lesser people walk away from Jesus in the midst of suffering. They run from Jesus because of their suffering. And then instead of running to Jesus, I was going to say this in the sermon, but I actually didn't say this, but um, it was good. And so I might hold it for a, another another message. But whenever you're experiencing suffering, you can either see it one or two ways. You can see suffering either as a courtroom or a classroom. Yeah, You can see suffering as a courtroom to where you put God on trial and then you begin to accuse him and you ask God, why? God, why did you do this? Or you can take the posture of James and John. You could talk, take the posture of my friend. You could take the posture of those who learn to suffer and say, oh, that's, this is a classroom. Yeah. yeah. And that I'm going to the school of pain. I'm going to the class of suffering. And the Lord Jesus is going to teach me something. And through my suffering, I'm actually going to be like him. And I'm going to be great. Yeah. Every testimony is an act of obedience through suffering. And it's amazing how many testimonies are already coming out. Mm-hmm. Just since really absorbing this message. Right? Yeah. We had another older gentleman who was baptized. It was one of my favorite moments of the entire Sunday. And uh, he had already went to the first two services. And in between services, he's already been going through a lot of rough stuff. You yeah. know? He tripped and fell and broke his dentures. Yeah. And was bleeding. And anybody could they easily- They had to call the paramedics and stuff yeah, to come get him on the They could easily start blaming, pointing the finger. And he was- he told me that I just can't wait to see what God does next because this isn't going to hold me back. Yeah. It's like I'm getting in that water. Yeah. And it was so inspiring. I mean, that's so to cool. Suffer with a purpose. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Don't run from suffering, run to it because the path of greatness is paved with suffering. The next secret was number two, learn to serve. I think one of the reasons that a lot of people will never do anything great is because they actually don't learn to serve, um, especially when it comes to the church. Mm-hmm. 
uh, when it comes to the Christian life, the heart of a Christian, the ethic of Christianity is that of a servant. Jesus brings the 12 together and he sits down with them. Uh, they're arguing about who's going to be great and they're indignant with each other. And, uh, and, and they, you know, they're arguing about the chair and who's going to sit in the, the thrones and the other 12 are upset. And Jesus pulls them in and he has this conversation with them. And he says, this shall not be so among you. The Gentiles and the rulers of the world, that's the kingdom of the world, they lord over you. But this shall not be so among you. And then he says, whoever want to be great amongst you must become the servant and whoever would be first must be the slave to all. Okay, so he's teaching them like, here's what greatness in my kingdom looks like. It, it looks like those who who serve. And I think that for the disciples and for many of us, they want they want to be served. Mm-hmm. They they want to be celebrities. Think about it. If they get that chair, they're the celebrity. Mm-hmm. And then everybody comes and looks and thinks, wow, they're so amazing. Those disciples, they're so great. Right. They want that recognition. They want the recognition. They want others to serve them. Their definition of greatness was when others serve them. Jesus says, no, 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 no. My definition of greatness is when you would learn to serve others. And if you think about it, we live in a service economy. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's the world we live in. Go to restaurants. What do you what do they have? They have sure. Servers. You go to Starbucks, right? Somebody's gonna make your drink for you. I mean, we outsource so many different things. Uh, and so everything's about how can others serve me? And then Jesus says, No, 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 like I want you to learn how to be a servant. And this celebrity attitude, and I, I think that this culture of being served that we live in has even become to where it's creeping into the church now, to where people go to church expecting to be served. And we have a wonderful serve team. Like we have a great serve team and we call them serve teams for a reason is because we want them to be great and to learn to serve. We don't call them volunteers because you don't volunteer in the kingdom of God. No, it's not how it works. Yeah, no, no, you serve. It's not even an option. It's, it's, it's not even just an opportunity, like it's an obligation to serve. I mean, that's why he says it here. He says, he says, if anyone wants to be great, do you want to be great, Trevor? I do. I want to be great. What do I need to do in order to be great? He says, you must, not if you feel like it, not volunteer, not maybe if it fits into your schedule. He says, if you want to be great, you must be a servant. So we don't have volunteers at our church, All right? We have servants. And I think the church needs to understand the heart of volunteering. Not is not the the heart of a servant is not one who volunteers. The heart of a servant is one who obeys. Yeah. And, and so, like um, what I said before, and I'll say it again because I think it's just so good. And people got mad at me the first time I said it, so I'll say it again because Jesus comes back and he says it again: uh, is if serving is beneath you, then greatness is beyond you. Like you'll never accomplish anything great in your life if you're always waiting for uh, waiting for greatness instead yeah. of going out and making it happen through service. It's not going to be handed to you. Right. No. Yeah. 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 And so I was thinking about um, how so often in the church, uh, I've seen it as a pastor for the last eight years, um, is people feel like, well, oh, I don't feel called to that. Um, serving is not something that you're called to. Something Serving is something that you're commanded to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, serving is vital to the spiritual growth of a believer. And I just think about your story, right? So like you're my assistant, you're hosting on Sundays now, you're discerning a call to ministry, you're growing in your faith, you're gonna be leading a community group this this round. You've been a Christian for a year now. and Two, two years two now. Years, yeah. And you, you started in, in the, the parking lot, mm-hmm. right? Uh, did you feel called to the parking lot? <laughs> No. Were you like, this is my calling, Lord? I didn't wake up one day and God called me to the parking lot to hold a sign. Yeah. You know, where I was just honored. But what did God do through that? Yeah. God raised me up. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think the way my heart was postured is I never had expectations. I just like, okay, we need a role. Nobody wants to sit in the parking lot. It's cold and rainy. Yeah. I'm just going to go do that. Right. So I would do it for you know, every service and show up. And God has just continued to build these opportunities and he's, he's rewarding me, mm-hmm. right? Because God rewards you. Yeah. God continues to reward me because of my servants. Right. And I'm just, all I can do as the path goes on, once you start from there, is it humbles you more as you mm-hmm. go. And as, you, as you're humbled, yeah. God exalts you. Yeah, so it's not like I ever feel like I deserve anything. Right. <laughs> yeah, we see that in, in, all, in the last sermon that I preached over mm-hmm. a text similar, Jesus in humility, I closed with, um, humility is the key to greatness. Uh, and so as we, as we humble ourselves, he exalts us. And the truth is, uh, first Peter talks about it, is that if you exalt yourself, God will humble you. 
Real quick. Yeah. If you exalt yourself, God, you should not be the one who exalts you. Right. All right. God's the one who exalts you. You humble yourself, God exalts you. And if you're unwilling to humble yourself, well, then God's going to humble you. And so as you learn to serve by seeing a need and meeting the need and just getting involved, then God's going to continue to right. grow you and lift you up and he's going to continue to exalt you. And it's greatest when God exalts you instead of you having to exalt yourself. Whether you feel like you're called or not. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I learned, I, I became a pastor because I spent eight years stacking chairs mm -hmm. and I was just faithful and following through and just being obedient in that. And I just kept continuing growing, growing, growing. If you're always waiting to, to, to find your calling, then you're never going to find your calling. You just need to find a place to serve and then your calling will find you in that yes, yes and jesus is trying to teach them that like hey uh it's not about you it's not about others coming and seeing you it's about you serving so others can come and meet me when it comes to the church in general there's opportunities outside of the church i think about the greatest in the kingdom my wife she just prays for people you know she's raising our two daughters and they go down for naps and she, she, she prays. You. Yeah, she puts up with me. I think about Bob and Kim, uh, a couple in our church. They have uh, you know six teenage foster boys that they're fostering, but they invite uh, young men and women into their home for dinner to disciple them. I think about my grandmother who is like 60 something years old. She works 60 hours. She's about to retire, but she still takes Saturdays and she prays with other women in the church. I mean, there's behind the scenes way to serve. There's one girl, Danielle, she has a vocal disorder, does ASL, but she also helps teach uh, others in our church ASL so we can be able to work with um, those with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And that's not a Sunday morning serve role, but that is still serving in the kingdom of God. Yeah. I think about those who work in the parking lot. They're like, I don't feel like called parking lot. Do you know that somebody decides whether or not they're going to come back to church in the first seven minutes? Mm -hmm. The best sermon, the first sermon uh, ever preached in a church is actually starts in the parking lot and then it goes to the front door. And if you're, people are you know preaching a bad message when someone rolls up, they're going to be turned off and they're not going to hear a word that I say. I am not the greatest in our church, right? I, I, I get to preach the word and that's great, but I'm not the greatest. It's men and women who show up early, leave late, give generously, make of their time, give their talents and their energy to furthering the kingdom of God. And it's not about them. It's all about Jesus. That is the greatest uh, to Jesus. Like when God is up in heaven and he's like, when God reads biographies, he's reading the biography of Trevor Knox who worked in the parking lot. Like that's God's like, man, this guy's so amazing. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what God looks for. Yeah, God's yeah. looking for servants. He's not looking for celebrities. He's not looking for people who make it all about them. I can't even dunk a basketball. Yeah. He's looking for people <laughs> who make it, hey, you could, you could probably choke somebody out though. <laughs> uh, but he's looking for people who are going to who are gonna serve, mm -hmm. humbly serve. Servant's heart. Yep. So mm -hmm. the first secret is to learn to suffer. The second secret is to learn to serve. That leads us to the last secret of Jesus's greatness. Learn to sacrifice. Yes. So this is actually one of the, um, the, the, the key verses in all of the gospel of Mark. It says, for the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A lot of commentators actually break Mark up. Um, the first 10, chapters is about the servanthood of Jesus. The last six chapters about the sacrifice of Jesus. So all we've seen so far in Mark is just Jesus serving people. He's serving them by teaching. He's serving them by healing. He's serving them by performing miracles. He's serving them by feeding multitudes. He's serving by walking alongside the road, taking time, spending time with one another, modeling prayer. For the first 10 chapters, all Jesus is doing is serving and then the last six chapters, he's sacrificing. So from here on out, it's nothing more than the death of Jesus. Yeah. So starting in chapter 11, it's one week, seven days. It's the death of Jesus. And what we see here in this section is Jesus's sacrifice for our sins. And because Jesus sacrificed for us, he's asking us to sacrifice for him. That the Christian life is not about you. The Christian life is about him and we want to be like him, which means we need a sacrifice like him. Uh, I think about this and the Lord just dropped it in my heart while I was preaching in the 9 a.m. service. And then I tried to repeat it later on and it didn't really go as good as it did in the 9 a.m. But, uh, but Jesus will not ask you to do something that he is unwilling to do himself. The reason Jesus asks us to sacrifice for him is because he's made the greatest sacrifice for us. He gave us his life. 
And as Christians, we must be willing to give our lives to him. Mm -hmm. And the reason many people will never be great is because they're too busy holding on to their life instead of letting it go and following after him. Yeah, that's the entire Christian walk, Yep. right? A sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So it's not always even just about, okay, I have to sacrifice my time, right? Sometimes you have to sacrifice your pride. Yeah. Sometimes you have to sacrifice, like discipleship is hard. Mm -hmm. Walking up to somebody you may not be too familiar with right. and you want to start spreading the word of God, it takes courage, yeah. okay? That's something God would do. And he yeah. would not expect, you know, he wouldn't expect you to do anything. Yeah. He wouldn't do it himself. Oh yeah. And all, I mean, sacrificing our desires or our sin even, I mean, but if we give our sin to him, he gives us his sinlessness and righteousness. And so that's the secret to Jesus' greatness, to learn to suffer, to learn to serve and to learn to sacrifice. And I just want to encourage you that God will not ask you to do something that he is unwilling to do himself. The reason Jesus is great is because he did all three of these things and he did all three of them for you. Amen. So, Hey guys, thanks for checking out the Rundown Podcast. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And hey, leave us a comment if you have any questions at all. We'd love Absolutely. to get back to you. And we'll see you next time. Hey, I'll see you next time.